This morning we're leaving John chapter 6 and we're moving into John chapter 7. And in doing that, we're really coming to a whole other place. A different place. Physically a different place. Jesus had been uh, preaching and teaching in the region of Galilee. And now he's going back to Judea. Going back to the area around Jerusalem into that southern region of Israel. What we read in the coming chapters isn't necessarily good. Because Jesus had been doing all of these miracles and doing all of this teaching in Galilee, and now he's going back toward Jerusalem, going back toward the cross. He's actually moving his way now toward the crucifixion. And all of those miracles and all of those things that Jesus said while he was in Galilee had now been reported back to the Jewish religious leaders in the temple in Jerusalem. And that little spark of anger that they felt toward Jesus before had now ignited into a flame of anger. And from this point forward through the remainder of the Gospel of John, the Jews have one goal in mind. One thing is on their mind, and that is to kill Jesus. So we come to verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word. Uh, Lord, open our hearts and minds again to the, the, the scriptures that we read here this morning and in chapter 7 of John's Gospel. Lord, let us understand uh, your position here. Lord, let us understand what it was that you were going through and, and the direction that you were having ha headed toward. Let us understand that the divine timing behind everything that happened in your life. Lord, let us, let us read these words and let us hear these words with great understanding because uh, there's great hope in what we hear here. And we'll, we'll get to that at the end of the sermon, but there's a, uh, there's a, a message behind all of this that's uh, joyful. And Lord, let us see that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. At this point, Jesus had been ministering in, uh, in Galilee, the northern part of Israel, for some 18 months. And now he's headed back to Jerusalem, headed back into Judea. He'd been avoiding that. It says he walked in Galilee and he didn't want to go to Judea because they were seeking to kill him there. Now understand, when John talks about the Jews here, he's specifically talking about the Jewish religious leadership. He's talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the priests and the high priests and the scribes and the Sanhedrin and all those leaders who are in the temple there in Jerusalem. They specifically were seeking to kill Jesus already at this point. So here he is in Galilee. He says he wants to walk in Galilee, that he didn't want to go to Judea because they said that they wanted to kill him. But something happens here. Another feast. There's another feast in, in Jerusalem. And we're told it's the Feast of Tabernacles. Other places in Scripture is called the, the Feast of Booths. Same thing. Back in the book of Leviticus in chapter 23, God had commanded uh, that the Israelites, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew children as they were, that they celebrate a feast day, the Feast of Tabernacles, of Booths, in the middle of the month that we now call October. So that gives us kind of an idea of when these things were happening. And that celebration was to celebrate how God took care of uh, the nation of Israel while they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. While they were out there moving from place to place, they had booths, they had tabernacles that they would move with them. That's what they stayed in. It was basically little houses that they would pack up and take with them when they went. God had provided and God was watching over and giving them everything they needed. And then he led them through all of that 40 years and then eventually into the promised land. So all of this celebration, the, the celebration of tabernacles was a celebration of God taking care of his people. So this was a joyous time. This feast was a, a celebration. Jewish historians tell us this was a week-long event, so it's seven days of, uh, of a good time. They were, this was designed to, uh, by God's purpose to be a time of Thanksgiving, kind of like we would celebrate Thanksgiving now. So this is a, this is a happy feast. As we noted several times in past sermons, Jesus always kept the law. 
Jesus always kept the law of God. He kept the law of Moses perfectly. The law demanded that Jews celebrate this feast day, and the place to celebrate the feast day was in Jerusalem. So here Jesus is. He's in Galilee. He's in Galilee. That man, in order to celebrate this feast correctly, he needed to get back to Jerusalem. In a sense... We kind of pick up where we left off in chapter 6 because we know that the underlying theme of chapter 6, for those that were with us through that chapter, that the underlying theme there was really a, a whole discussion about false disciples, false believers in Jesus Christ. And we'll hear a little bit more of that here in chapter 7. Not the major theme, but there's some of it here. Verse 2, now the Jews, the Jews' feast of tabernacle was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here, go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're, you are doing. So Jesus, he had some half-brothers. He had four other brothers that Scripture gives by name, uh, who were born of Mary, whose father was Joseph, uh, and they were urging him, they were telling him, Go back to Judea, go back to the feast. Why were they telling him that in verse 3? That your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. To understand, there were plenty of false disciples that we already talked about up in Galilee. There were also a lot of false disciples in Judea, in the southern part of Israel. You say, how do I know they were false? Well, remember when Jesus rode into, into Jerusalem on a donkey? He came down the Mount of Olives, and, and one day they were cutting down the palm leaves and laying their coats before him as he came in, and they were shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Well, those same disciples at that point, a week later, would be standing before the praetorium of Pontius Pilate yelling, crucify him. So there were plenty of false disciples to go around both in Galilee and in Judea. So his, his brothers are urging him. They're saying, go down there to Judea and do the same kinds of miracles, preach the same kinds of sermons and teaching that you were doing, do the things that you did here in Galilee, down there in uh, Jerusalem, in Judea, to prove yourself. They said to him in verse 4, for no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself uh, to the world. I said, look, if you really are the somebody that you claim to be, if you really are somebody, then you need to go down there to Jerusalem and reveal yourself and show the world and do the miracles that they were doing up here because nobody who wants to be somebody acts in secret. So go down there. Go down there and do the same things down there that you did up here so that you can prove yourself to be who you claim to be. Now there was a reason behind that. We see it very plainly in verse 5. For even his brothers did not believe in him. That's always hard for me to wrap my mind around that particular verse. How on earth could Jesus' brothers who lived with him his entire life not believe that he was who he claimed to be? But they didn't. They did not believe in him. So basically what they were telling Jesus is, we need more proof ourselves. Go down there to Judea and keep doing the same kinds of things that you're doing up here. Prove yourself to us. Now you hear that, it kind of makes me think these brothers were maybe on the edge of belief. We've all known people like that. They, they, were, they were leaning toward believing in Jesus Christ, but not quite there yet. It makes me think of people like Agrippa. Remember when Paul talked to Agrippa in court there, and Agrippa looked at Paul and said, Paul, almost you persuade me. Almost. I, I'm not there yet, but, but I, I hear what you're saying. I'm almost there, and I think that's where Jesus' brothers are here. Eventually, they would come to believe in Jesus Christ. Eventually, it, it's going to take them a while. But at this point, they didn't believe. They saw the miracles that Jesus did. They heard the words that He spoke. They could not deny the miracles. That, that work was right in front of their eyes, but they did, like everyone else, deny Jesus' words. They didn't believe. They didn't believe in the power behind the miracles that they had seen. So they're saying, look, we need more proof. Go down there to Judea and prove that you are who you say you are. How did Jesus respond to that? Verse 6, Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. 
Jesus says that over and over and over again in Scripture. My time has not yet come. He's telling them, look, my time to go back to Jerusalem, to head toward uh, Judea and go back to Jerusalem, to, to go to the cross, that time hasn't come yet. Understand, everything that Jesus did, from the time of His birth until the time that He ascended into heaven, everything that He did was laid out according to God's perfect timing, according to God's perfect plan. Romans 5 verse 6 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. In due time. At the perfect time Jesus died. Everything that happened in Jesus' life was unfolded by due time, by right time, by perfect time. Everything, every second of Jesus' life, he was held accountable for. He was always on a divine schedule. So he says to his brothers here, it's not time yet. Not quite time for me to go down there to Judea. Not, not yet. But he adds a little phrase there, and I find it interesting. I think you do too, probably. He says, but your time is always ready. Look, we live according to God's plan, each one of us. But understand, our lives, our lives don't have the impact on the world that Jesus' life had. Jesus, Jesus' life was planned out to the second. Our life isn't like that. We're, our, our life... Our life simply doesn't have, I'll put it this way, if, if you after church, I'm talking to that back row back there especially, if you after church decide that you want to go to the dinner table after church today, and that's fine, that's good, but it won't have any kind of internal impact on the world. But if Jesus decides he's going to go eat with somebody, when he went to eat with sinners, it did. Everything that Jesus did her purpose. Every moment of his time counted. We in our lives, we, uh, we, we do our best to be obedient to God. Sometimes we're blessed. Sometimes we sin and we, as we live out our lives, we, uh, we bear the consequences of the choices that we make. That wasn't true, Jesus. Everything he did counted for the glory of God. He didn't put any wood or hay or stubble on the foundation. Everything he laid in his life was either precious stones or gold. So everything he did and every second that he lived mattered. Now like that for us. Everything that Jesus did was a result of a divine appointment from God. Our, really, our only divine, divine appointment with God is the appointment to die. Scripture says in Hebrews 9, verse 27, As it is appointed to man to die once, but after this to judgment. So our time is always ready. Our time has always been ready. The only real choice that we make that has eternal consequences in this life that we live is the choice to receive Jesus as Lord or Savior. So Jesus says to them in verse 7, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. The world cannot hate you. And I understand, it's really important that you understand who Jesus was speaking to when he said these words. The world cannot hate you. Who was he talking to? He was talking to his brothers. Those four guys. Now let me ask you a question. What was their status with the Lord? They were unbelievers, right? The world cannot hate you. Why could the world not hate his brothers? Because they were unbelievers. They were of the world. Some people read that and say, well, he's talking to Christians. The world can't hate Christians. It can only hate Jesus. That's not true. The world doesn't hate unbelievers because unbelievers belong to the world. They don't belong to Christ. Why is it that the world hates Jesus? Jesus tells us very clearly, he says, the world hates me because I testify of the world's deeds, that the world's deeds are evil. When, when I read that, my mind goes through several scriptures, but the one that really comes to my mind is where Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy, in chapter 1, verse 9, he says, the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate 
For the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, the profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and manslayers, for fornicators and sodomites and kidnappers and liars and perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which committed to, which was committed to my trust, so Paul he runs through a whole list there of sins. Whole list of sins. He says that's not all of them, but if there be any other thing contrary to the doctrine, that they, they belong in that list too. But he's given a whole list there of evil deeds that the word the world does. Jesus said, look, I, uh, the world hates me because I testify that they're doing those kinds of things, that their works are evil. But many, many people, they want to put a gag on Jesus. They want to shut his mouth. They want to be accepted. They want to be loved. They might even want to be a part of the church, a part of the community and all of that. They want a fellowship. But they don't want to hear Jesus confronting them for the evil that they do in their lives. They don't want to be confronted with their sin. They don't want to hear it. I think that was true back in Jesus' day, and I think it's still true today. People just don't want to hear that their deeds are evil. In verse 9, Jesus goes on. When he said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. So he stayed. They took off. They went down to Judea. They were headed to Jerusalem to the feast. And Jesus stayed there in Galilee. He walked in Galilee, Scripture says. But understand, he didn't stay there very long. His time had not come at that moment. But it wouldn't be very long that the timing would change. Verse 10, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up uh, to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Now they always talk about going up to Jerusalem. Here in, in our geography, when we talk about going up, we usually talk about going north. You know, for, on a map, usually it's up, so we, that's the way we kind of think of things. It wasn't so. They were actually headed south. But they always talked about going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was on a mountain, right? Mount Zion. All the mountains that were around it. So when they went up, according to their geography, they were literally going up. It was a pretty steep height from what I understand going that direction. They had to go over the Mount of Olives. So they're going up to Jerusalem, but it says Jesus went after them. He went in secret. Now you hear that and you think, well, since they left beforehand, the brothers left, and I'm thinking there's probably a day or two difference here. Scripture doesn't tell us how much head start they got, but they got a head start. And you're thinking, well, that means that Jesus must have gotten to the feast after them. But that wasn't the case. They arrived at the same time. And you're thinking, well, how, how does that happen? How does somebody leave ahead? Unless I walk real fast and pass them, which Scripture doesn't say that happened. How, how did they get there at the same time? Well, did Jesus do another miracle? Did he somehow transport himself into Jerusalem? No. Scripture tells us he took a shortcut. He took a shortcut. He went uh, to a place that Jews never go. He went back through Samaria. The Jews they always thought the Samaritans were a defiled people. They didn't want to go into the, uh, to the area of Samaria, which was right in the middle of Israel. So when they went north and south of Galilee to uh, to Judea, they went around. They took a looping route either to the east or to the west to get around Samaria to go to go that route. You might remember when Jesus came from Judea and went to Galilee, he went through Samaria. He said he had to. He had a divine appointment there with a woman at Jacob's well. He talked to the whole village of Sakar there and they all came to believe in Jesus Christ. And now he's in Galilee, he's going back to Jerusalem, he took the same route which was much shorter, and because of that, he and his brothers had get to this feast around the same time. Luke tells us in Luke 9, verse 51, And I came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. He went through uh, Samaria, but he didn't stop. 
Not this time. He didn't stop at any villages, didn't stop at any wells. His mind was set on going back to Jerusalem. He had a divine appointment to keep. So he's on his way back, going through Samaria. Now understand, this feast was taking place, and the Jews were already looking for him. They were expecting him to be there, first of all, because they knew it was the law <coughs> that all the men were supposed to go to Jerusalem for this feast. But it wasn't just that. They expected Jesus to, look, to be there. They were looking for him, but they couldn't find him. Verse 11, the, the Jews sought him at the feast, and they said, where is he? Where is Jesus? His fame. By this time, it already spread all over Judea, all over Galilee. And he was a celebrity, kind of. We talked about that. Everybody wanted to see the miracle worker. So here they are, they're at the feast, and they're expecting Jesus to be there. And they're looking around and saying, where is he? We can't find him. They weren't expecting him to take a secret route, to come from a direction that he wasn't supposed to be coming from. They didn't think he'd be coming from Samaria. He kind of sneaks into town without being noticed. But even at that, their main topic of conversation, the thing they were all talking about, and remember these Jewish feasts would draw large numbers of people. The normal citizenship of Jerusalem at that time was around 250,000 people, which was large. And every time they'd have one of these feasts, there'd be nearly a million people in town. So all these people are there, and they're all talking. What are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus. Verse 12. There was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceived the people. So they were arguing. Some of them were saying that Jesus is a good guy. And others were saying, no, he's a liar. Don't listen to him. He's deceiving people. So they were arguing. But understand, all of that arguing wasn't loud. They were, this was all going on in whispers. Kind of behind the scenes, you know, they're gathering in little groups and they're they're grumbling and they're mumbling and they're uh, they're carrying on, but they didn't say it very loudly. Verse thirteen, however, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Nobody was talking very loud about Jesus. They were afraid. They were afraid of those Jewish leaders back there because they knew the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus, so they didn't want to be too closely connected to him. You didn't want to be a supporter of Jesus. You didn't want to talk too much about Jesus openly because you didn't want those Jewish leaders coming after you. So all of this was kind of done in quiet places. Jesus, uh, again, kind of sneaks into town, comes by way of Samaria. And understand, once Jesus got into Judea, He never left. He never went back to Galilee. The remainder of his earthly lifetime, which would have been several more months, uh, was right there in Judea. He didn't spend all that time in Jerusalem. Most of the time he was out in the countryside, out in the villages, moving from place to place to place. He eventually came back to Jerusalem. When he did, he would be crucified. But he spent the rest of that time in Judea. If you want to hear about what Jesus did during those months of ministry, you can go to the Gospel of Luke, and Luke lays it out in great detail between chapter 9 and chapter 19. But here he's come to the feast. He's come to the feast, and I, I, I tell you, again, he's on this divine schedule. And again, not one minute of his time is being wasted here. Every minute of Jesus' life counted and he used every minute of it wisely. His life was completely planned out from the time that he was born, throughout his entire sinless life, all the way to the time that he died on the cross and was buried in the tomb and was raised from the dead, all the way to the time when he ascended into heaven. All the way to the time when he went back to where he came from. But while he was here on earth, not one second of his time was wasted. He spent all of that time doing miracles and especially speaking, teaching, and preaching, and telling about the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you, most of the people that heard Jesus speak didn't like what he had to say. They didn't like it when Jesus said he is the bread of life. They didn't like it when he told them that he is the only way to enter into the kingdom of God through him. They didn't like it. They didn't like it when he told them that only he could give them eternal life. They didn't like it. They didn't like it when he told them, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. 
They didn't like it, especially when he confronted them, when he told them that their deeds were evil. They didn't want to hear it. And again, I'll say things have not changed all that much. Let me ask you if, you, if you had the opportunity to do what Jesus is going to do in the coming verses, if you had an opportunity to stand before the leaders, to stand before an important group of leaders, let's say just for instance that you were going to give a speech or talk to the people who were in Congress, you had that opportunity, would you stand before them and look them straight in the eye and tell them your deeds are evil? Most Christians don't do that. They don't do that because they're afraid. They're afraid of not being accepted. They're afraid that, that people are going to come against them. They're, they're afraid of the persecution. They're, they're afraid. Now, Jesus, Jesus tells those leaders, your, your deeds are evil. There's a confrontation that's beginning here. A confrontation that he is really starting to turn up between Jesus and, and these worldly people that are there in Jerusalem. How evil were their deeds? Well, Jesus eventually tells them that their father is the devil. But understand, he also had true disciples. People who truly believed in him. And to them, he said in John 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, now notice the contrast between what he says to these believers and what he said to his brothers who did not believe. He says the world can hate you, but he says to you believers, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me first. Hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, as it did with his brothers. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world didn't hate his brothers who were unbelievers, but the world hates you because you're a believer in Jesus Christ. It goes on in verse 20, he says, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they also will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours also. So what we see going on here in verse 7 is really a transition in Jesus' ministry in which he's Moving into more and more confrontation, there's going to be more and more conflict as he works his way toward the cross. Going to be a lot of persecution going on in the coming chapters. A, 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 lot, of, a, a lot of bickering and arguing and, and, and Jesus confronting. But I want to show you something good. We're going to move into all of that in the coming chapters, coming verses. But I, I want to show you something good before we leave this morning. And it really relates back to what we're reading here in these very same verses. In order to see it, you have to go to the book of Acts. So we're changing to another book for a second. But if you go to the book of Acts, and if you go to chapter 1, this is the, the chapter where Jesus ascends into heaven. He ascends to the right hand of the Father. And all of Jesus' remaining disciples were there to witness that. They saw His ascension, and then in verse 12... Then they turned, returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, the mountain of Mount of Olives, uh, near, uh, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, uh, they went into the upper room where there were staying uh, Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas uh, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The Judas Iscariot had died by this point, so there are 11 apostles left, 11 that are named there. They went back to the upper room after Jesus ascended, to, I believe the same upper room where Jesus had first saw them after he, uh, after he was resurrected. But they didn't go there alone. They, they went back to the upper room and there were, there were women with them. Women. Which women went with them? Well, Luke tells us in Luke 23, verse 55, the women who had come with him from Galilee. Matthew confirms that. Matthew 27, verse 55, many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there. Many women. 120 people gathered in that room and many of them were women. These women, they were true disciples of Jesus Christ. They were true thought. There wasn't anything false about these ladies. They were there. They were with Jesus through his ministry. These were the same women who were there, who were there when Jesus died on the cross, who were there 
When Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea placed his body in the tomb, they were the same ones that went to the tomb on Easter Sunday and, and witnessed the resurrection. These women were strong, strong ladies, strong believers in Jesus Christ. Who, who were they? They were ladies like Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, of James the Less, the other apostle named Jack Solomon was there. That's just some of their names, but there were many of them, many women there. But there was also another group. Notice there that there's one last group there. Who were they? Verse 14. Jesus' brothers. Isn't that interesting? 120 true disciples are left by the time that Jesus ascended into heaven. And out of those 120 of them, four of them, four of them, Matthew gives us their names. And he gives us their names. They're uh, um, James and, and Joseph and Simon and, and Judas. But there are four of them left. Four of these brothers are among the 120 true disciples of Jesus Christ. And I say that's interesting because these are the same brothers who we just read about in John 7 verse 5 who did not believe in Him. They did not believe in Him, yet by the time a book, the book of Acts is written, they did. What was it that changed their minds? How was it that they came to believe in Jesus Christ? And I really believe it all boils down to the resurrection, the raising of Jesus from the dead. These same brothers, they knew Jesus had died. They knew He was in the tomb. And they also knew without a shadow of a doubt that He had conquered death and He had been raised from the dead. They had, that was the best, the strongest miracle work that Jesus ever did. And they could not deny that from that point that Jesus was raised, these brothers, I believe, they really thought that He was the Son of God, that He died on the cross as a payment for their sins, that He was raised from the dead for their justification. They became true believers, and they were among the 120 that were there in the upper room, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And I say there's great hope in that, because what that tells us is, if Jesus' brothers who were unbelievers could become, uh, could become true believers in Jesus Christ, that means unbelievers that are in the world today can still make that same choice, can't they? Mm -hmm. Unbelievers can still come to saving faith in Jesus just like his brothers did. And there's great hope in that because we all know unbelievers. We pray for them, we talk to them, we know them. And there's hope. There's hope that one day they'll make the same choice Jesus' <laughs> brothers made. But I'll close this morning because I want to ask you a question. It's the same question that Pontius Pilate asked. When Pontius Pilate stood before the Jews who were accusing Jesus of all these uh, iniquities, they were accusing Jesus of many things. When he, when he stood uh, with Pilate on the praetorium and looking down on all the Jews, he asked the Jews a question. Matthew 27, verse 22, Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? I'm laying that same question before you this morning. What are you going to do with this man, Jesus, who is called Christ? What are you going to do with it? And you say, well, I'm already a believer. That question doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. It applies to every one of us. What are we going to do, each one of us individually, not as a group? What are you going to do with this man whose name is Jesus who's called the Christ? If you're an unbeliever, I hope what you're going to do with him is you're going to believe. If you're a false believer, I hope you're going to change some things in your mind and you're going to come to true saving faith in Jesus Christ. But if you're already a believer, what are you going to do with him now? Are you going to follow Him? Are you going to take up your cross and carry it daily? Are you going to love Him by showing Him your obedience? Are you going to follow after Him? I can't answer that question for you. Only you can answer that question for yourself. But I can say for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I hope you answer the same way. And I'm going to close there this morning. We'll, we'll pick up in chapter 7, God willing, next week. I love the Gospel of John. I think it's always been my favorite book of the Bible. And I hope you're getting something out of it. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I'm glad.
glad you didn't give us some number before I, when I started preaching because there's no way I'd have remembered it that long. 309.